Fantastic, we're rolling, we can begin. Good morning. Good morning. It's lovely to see you all this morning. Did you miss me last week? Okay, two and a half people. <laughs> two and a half people missed me last week. And uh, well, anyway, from my point of view, it's really good to be here. It's good to be back. And uh, it's good that you're here as well. Um, I got lots of birthday texts last week because Terry said it was going to be my birthday. And he suggested it was going to be a big one. But um, it wasn't. No, it was big, but as I said to Terry, you see, he missed this, but he said, is, is it a big one? And I said, they're all big, Terry, but it's not special. You see, it's not special. So, uh, but it was my birthday. So anyway, you sent me a text. That was great. Haven't got any present yet, which isn't so good, but anyway, there's still time, and there's always next year. In fact, that's my brother said, oh, was it your birthday? I thought it was next year. Oh, very funny. Anyway, it's great to see you all this morning. Um, some announcements. What do we need to announce? Tomorrow, Terry will be in a shed again. If I get that to you, Bobby. If, yeah. <laughs> Terry will be in a shed again, which would be great. I will be alive from Greystones on Wednesday at 12 o'clock, probably with Reuben. We had a great time in Belfast with Reuben, didn't we? And Thomas the Lauren as well. And they're coming back down here again at tea time tonight. They go back to uh, England on Wednesday. Um, but they're coming to have a couple of days in Greystones. So we're praying for weather. Dawn's never off her weather up. Is the sun going to shine tomorrow? Is the sun going to shine on Tuesday? Oh, it's raining. Oh, it's cloudy. Oh, it's... It keeps changing all the time. But anyway, we had a lovely time up there. Um, yeah, I think that's all the announcements, isn't it? Nothing else to mention, is there? Um, usually on, uh, at this time on our service, we would do uh, birthdays when we ask people, have they had a birthday in the preceding week? or in the week to come, or in fact, even today. So I'm just asking, has anyone here um, had a birthday recently, or even today? Is that a hand? Oh, it's a hand. Oh. When was your, well, come on up and tell me all about it. And anybody else had a birthday? What, did you say Audrey Glover? Oh gosh, this comes as a shock to me, a surprise. Or is it your birthday? So, um, anyway. It's all glued. I'll just hold it. Tell us, what, tell us when your birthday is, Sebastian. 26th of July. Are you sure? Because you can't even say it. <laughs> the 26th of July, that was ages ago, wasn't it? What did you do? Was it good fun? Yeah. Well, thank you for that deep information. And um, what age were you on the 20th of the 6th of July? Eight. You were eight? Is that all? I thought you were about 15 or 16 or 17 or... No? Wow. But well, that is brilliant. And, uh, Madam, what is your name and uh, when, when is your birthday? Today. Today! <laughs> and Audrey, would you like to sh Don't remind you, do you want to share your age? You just don't want to bother. Have a guess. <laughs> 45. <laughs> it, begins with, it begins with an 8 and ends with a no. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Audrey, you're looking fantastic. And uh, we just want to celebrate everybody's birthday from 8 to 80. Where would you get this? This is brilliant, isn't it? Eight. Eight to 80. So um, we've got some badges of whether you can take one because I'm not going to put it on you. And, but we're going to pray. So is it okay if we pray? God's blessing on both of you. So let's join together to pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for every day you give us and for every year we celebrate. Thank you, Lord, for the, for the journey of life on this wonderful adventure. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you made us and you set us on our way and you continue on that journey with us. Father, I really thank you um, for Sebastian. Thank you, Lord, for his, um, thank you for his years. Thank you for his faith. Thank you for the beautiful things that you're doing in his life. Thank you for the beautiful family that he's a part of. Thank you that he's a part of this amazing family in our church where he's loved, where he's cherished, where he's encouraged. 
And Lord, we thank you for him. Thank you for his laughter. Thank you for his fun. Thank you for his energy. And we pray, Lord, that as he grows, that you will help him to grow well, that he will know that he's loved by you, that you will always be with him. Thank you, Father, you've got plans for him. And we pray you'll help him to trust you in all of those plans. So, Lord, we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. And we thank you for Audrey, Lord. Thank you for her wonderful faith that she shares so freely, for her beautiful, generous spirit. Like, Father, thank you that you've been with her through all of her life and that she loves you. Father, continue on this adventure with her. Father, keep her energy levels high. Thank you for the way she serves you and serves people with such an amazing heart. Father, let that never change. And let it be a blessing to her, Lord. Thank you for Adrian. Thank you for them as a couple. Bless her marriage. Bless her home. Bless those that they love. So, Father, we leave her in your hands, in your care. And we thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Do you want to grab a badge? And then you can go and sit down again. That would be... No, it's okay. Just you... You grab it and go. Grab it and go. It's a grab it and go day. That is great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think it kind of peels off, Audrey, in some kind of way. Oh, you've got it peeled off. Oh, well done. So, we're going to sing. Um, well, I'm going to sing. You can sing along gently if you like. Did you sing last week? Because I could have sworn I heard singing. With Brian said, let's all sing this song. What are you saying? I'm not sure we're allowed to do that. But anyway, I'm not encouraging you to sing very loud. But we're going to sing, I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. So you can sing along to it gently or you can listen to the words. But we'll use these to remind ourselves that this is an amazing story. A story to be retold and retold. Because it's not just something that happened a long time ago but we live in the light of it today and every day. Of the Christ who 
singing with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea So let's join together to pray, shall we? Let's all pray. Father, you are so good to us. And Father, we're really pleased that we're here with you today. Father, we come to sit at your feet, to sit at your throne. Father, we come to hear your voice. We come to hear your words of guidance, of encouragement. Words that refresh us, renew us, that forgive us, lift us up, set our feet on a rock. We come to hear your words of life. We come to recommit ourselves to you afresh today. So, Father, we're so happy that we're here from the youngest to the oldest. Father, we come as your children, joined as your family. So let's just take a moment's quietness to bring our own prayers to him. Things we want to say thank you for, perhaps, or things we want to say sorry for. But whatever they may be, let's do that at this moment. So, Father, hear our prayers. Father, we come giving you thanks and bring you praise. Father, we're hungry to hear from you today. And if we're not hungry, Lord, create in us a hunger and a thirst for you. Father, if our minds are wandering, please bring them back to focus them, to gaze them, to gaze on the beauty of your, your being, to, to gaze on your face, to feel your presence. For, Lord, we want to connect with you today. We want to meet with you today. We simply don't want to go through some kind of ritual. But we want to be with you, our God who loves us and who has given himself for us. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me, who died for me, who died for me. So, Father, come, we pray. And we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again a song that does say hungry before we have a reading. And today is all about being <clears throat> hungry and thirsty for God. That is the, 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 um, the storyline today. It's uh, Mount Carmel. We're going to Mount Carmel today to meet with Elijah and the prophets of Baal and people who had distanced themselves from God, forgotten about him, lost the vision, lost the passion, lost, lost him. Um, but we want to not lose him and we slip away so easily. We don't want to do that. But if we do, as we often do, we want him to bring us back. Just like that opening hymn, he's like the shepherd that places a sheep on his shoulders and brings them home, brings them back, renews them, restores them. That's what we want today. So we're going to sing this song that says, Hungry I come to you, for I know you satisfy
Hungry I come to you For I know you said it's fine I am empty but I know your love Does not run dry So I wait for you So I wait Falling on my knees Offering all of me Jesus, you're all This heart is living for Broken I run to you for your arms are open wide I am weary but I know your touch restores my life so I wait for you so I wait Falling on my knees Offering all of me Jesus, you're all This heart is living for I'm falling on Offering all of me Jesus, your all this heart is living for I'm falling on my knees Offering all of me Jesus, your all this heart is living for So just before Adrian comes to do the reading and uh, it's going to be a great reading just want to kind of fill you in where the story has come to we have been up Mount Sinai, and uh, we have seen the people come there to get the commands of God about hard to live when they enter the promised land. That's what that was all about. What are the rules? What are the guidelines? What is the best way to live in a relationship with God in the promised land? Things went well for a while, but things then went downhill badly. So the, the part of the story we're looking at today is a time that's really, really low in Israelite history. They've got a king... Ahaz, Ahab, and um, he's the worst king they've ever had. Wasn't that great? They've had lots of bad kings, but this one has been the worst ever. They've forgotten about their God. They kind of have still that kind of memory, and it's still on the outside. They are God's people, but their hearts are far from him. They worship Baal. They worship an idol. They've drifted and drifted and drifted. So God sends a drought. Elijah the prophet prays for no rain, and no rain falls. Baal is the god of the weather. So this is a challenge to him. No rain falls. For one year, for two years, for three years. Then God speaks to Elijah in that third year and says, It's time to go to see the king. And let's get things sorted out. So he goes to see the king. And that's where Adrian is going to take up the story. As Elijah meets Ahab. Thank you, Adrian. A 
our reading this morning is from 1 Kings chapter 18, commencing to read at verse 17. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us, let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood but not set far to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood but not set far to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by far. He is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls you, and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull given them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response, no one answered, and they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them, saying, Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God, he is a God. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or travelling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be wakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom until their blood flowed. Midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob's, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be, in, shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seers of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, 
and also licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This is the Lord's precious word. Thank you, Adrian. <clears throat> Great story, isn't it? Great story. A story you know really well, I'm sure. So here's the next mountain we've been up to today. We've been up many mountains. I hope you're getting fit. I realize how unfit I am. Could be changes. Last week we were up Mount Nebo with Terry. Hope you had a good time. Terry did not restrict himself to one mountain. He was up lots of mountains. I thought, I gave you one mountain to talk about. You're up and down those mountains. I don't know. But anyway, Mount Nebo, where he saw the promised land, but he wasn't able to enter it. But it was like seeing the future. Wouldn't it be great to be able to see the future? God brought him onto that mountain and says, this is what the future looks like. It'll look great. So, but we've now moved on. People are in the promised land. This story um, takes place almost 3,000 years ago. It's a long time, isn't it? As I was thinking about this story today, Lucas, I was thinking about you. Remember you stood up here as Elijah? Remember that, Lucas? Yeah? Cut up those bulls and get that water sloshed all over the place. But the Israelites had been in the land for quite a while. They'd grown strong. And they came to their kind of pinnacle, their peak, under King David, and then under Solomon. Things had really progressed and done so well. The nation was strong. The nation was close to God. The nation was in a good place. And then there's a turning point. I don't know if you're very familiar with the book of First and Second Kings, but you should really read it. But there's a turning point in First Kings chapter 11, verse 1. That's where it all begins to go downhill. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 1. And it's the line that says, Now Solomon had many wives. That's where it all began to go downhill. Not necessarily because he had many wives, but because he had many foreign wives. He had 700 wives, as you may know, and 300 concubines. That is a lot of wives. That's a lot of women in your life. Adrian's just shaking his head here at the thought of having one woman in his life. You really have to feel sorry for Solomon, but he had many wives. Those wives came from many countries. They came and they brought their many gods, and that spelt disaster for the United Kingdom of Israel. Because when they went first went in, when they came out of Egypt, they were just a ramshackle bunch of people. Remember, they went in as 70 people. It was just a group of people. They were not a nation. They came out about 2 million strong, but they were still a ramshackle bunch of people. People like David whipped them into shape, created a nation out of them, a nation to be proud of, a strong nation, a godly nation. Um, but here the decline began because foreign gods started to infiltrate. The kingdom broke up from one kingdom to two. There was a northern kingdom that was known as Israel, and there was a southern kingdom known as Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel had ten tribes. The southern kingdom had Two tribes. God wasn't happy. But he said for the sake of David, he would not do anything during the time of Solomon. For the sake of David, for what David had done and the relationship that they had, he wouldn't simply whip the kingdom away from Solomon, but it would all go pear-shaped after that, and it did. After Solomon broke into two, two of his sons, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, became kings in the respective territories. But it was bad The northern king of Israel that we're looking at today had 19 kings. Do you know how many of them were good? None. Not even one. And when it came to Ahab, where we're at today, he was one of the worst of all. In chapter 16, it says, Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. Any of them. And they were bad. But here was someone who was badder than all the rest. Ahab. Of course, he married a foreign wife that we know, Jezebel. Her name has gone through history. 
And Jezebel's marriage to Ahab was, of course, a political alliance because that's what they did, and it brought strength to them. Um, it brought strength against the military might of the nations around them, and it opened up trade routes and so on. So it was, you know, it was a political alliance, but it was not a good alliance because Jezebel didn't just bring um, her contacts, she brought her gods with her, especially Baal and Asherah, the female counterpart. And that had a really immediate effect on Ahab because immediately he built a shrine to Baal at the very heart of his, the capital of Israel, which was Samaria. He just built this shrine, this altar, and worshipped this foreign god almost immediately. Chapter 16, verse 31, he took as wife Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbel of the Phoenicians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal, and he built, which he built in Samaria, and he also made a sacred post. But not only did Jezebel bring her gods with her, she wasn't simply looking for some kind of parody where I've got mine and you've got yours. No, she started, um, well, as it says in Kings 18, verse 4, Jezebel was killing off the prophets of the Lord. She was out to eliminate all the servants of God. This is a lovely lady, isn't she? Not only does she bring her own gods, but she wants to eliminate all the servants of Yahweh, the one true and living God. Of course, this is not unusual. This happens through life, through world, through history. It happens today. As we've talked about many times, Christians are the most persecuted religion in the world. Up to 80% of all religious persecution is directed at Christians. Killed, beaten, imprisoned, tortured. Or if you can't do that, made voiceless, silenced, sidelined happens today. And it happened then too. But it's into this scene, this really the lowest of the low in Israelite history, that Elijah comes. Elijah is going to be followed by Elisha, the next prophet. Two of the big names from the Old Testament. Into the darkness of this scene, because it's dark, dark, dark. And Elijah comes, and he's going to dominate the story over the next number of chapters. The nation had been led astray. Uh, Baal, who was a fertility god and a god of the weather. Very interestingly, he was sometimes called the Lord of rain and dew. He was the Lord of rain and dew. Two of the forms of moisture that made Canaan fertile. Very important. We all need rain and dew. But then Elijah comes along to Ahab, and listen to what he says in chapter 17, verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe and Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. This was going to show the impotence of Baal. He could do nothing, for he is nothing. He is no God. For there is no God except the one true and living God, Yahweh, that they served. And yet humanity... People like you and me are so messed up, we can take something that is nothing and worship it. We may not fashion an idol before us, but we can fashion an idol nevertheless. It could be called family or money or career or health or it could be anything. But we seem to be really good at ignoring the living God, the true God, the creator God, and making up our own little God, whatever we call him to be. So three years pass, and the Lord tells Elijah to go to Ahab. And when they meet, as we've read, um, Ahab said, Is that you, Elijah, you troubler of Israel? Elijah says, I'm not the problem here. You're the problem. You and your father's family are the problem. You brought this nation down, down, down. He said, I have not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the Baals. So Elijah issues a challenge. It is time to take a stand to remind the people who they are. 
to whom they belong, to the God that they serve. Verse 19. Summon the people, he said to the king, from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. She fed a lot of people, didn't she? All her own people. And so they stood on Mount Carmel. Got some little pictures of Mount Carmel. What's, what's the first one? What's the one just back there, Bobby? Um, yeah, so... Do you know what you're looking at? You're looking at the Mediterranean Sea on the left of the picture, and that is the island of Cyprus, that big island stuck in the middle. Maybe you've been there on holiday. And to the right of that is Israel. And the black arrow is pointing at where Mount Carmel is. The yellow arrow is pointing at the Sea of Galilee. You see that little body of water? And if you follow the Jordan down to the bigger body of water, that's the Dead Sea. The purple arrow points to where Jerusalem is. That's where Jerusalem is. So Mount Carmel is right up in that north corner. From there, you can see, um, well, that's the whole kind of uh, mountain range of Carmel. And uh, the Mediterranean is about nine miles to the, the west. Um, and the Sea of Galilee is about 28 miles to the east. But from up there, you can see everything. Some of those arrows, it's not really very clear, but they, they kind of, the one that's orange that is pointing up in the middle, is pointing at Nazareth, which is where Jesus grew up. The arrow above it, which is more orangey, pointing down, is pointing at the town of Cana, where Jesus did his first miracle at that wedding. Do you remember he turned water into wine? The yellow one is pointing at, pointing at the peak at Mount Carmel, the highest point. So this is where they are. And the next picture, Bobby, is just a view from, um, from the top of Mount Carmel. And that's the Jezreel Valley down there. And next week, if you keep going across to the top of that picture, we're going to come to another mountain that we're going to go up next week, which is an amazing mountain. But the Jezreel Valley is where many battles were fought. Uh, and that area and the place below it, Megiddo, is also called Armageddon. That is where the Bible says that the final battle on earth will be fought in this valley. So this is a really kind of important region. But these guys are up here. He has called all Israel to come. I don't know how many people would have come, but all Israel, plus the 450 prophets of Baal, plus the 400 prophets of Asherah, and there is Elijah, all on his own. Ear. But he has issued a challenge to the people. But why did he choose Mount Carmel? Well, he chose it because it was one of the key pagan worship places. It was the place, one of the main places for the worship of Baal. It was a, a pagan stronghold. So if you're into a sporting context, it would be like your team playing at home. That's what Elijah's saying. Meet me at Mount Carmel and think, hey, 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 Ahab will be saying, yeah, we go there all the time. That's, that's our home stadium. So it was going to be a good place for them to be. They would have home advantage. So they'd have an enormous advantage. There's Elijah, all on his own EO, and hundreds of prophets of an idol. Does that sound like Elijah is outnumbered? It does, kind of, doesn't it? But you know, that is what God does. That's the way God likes it. He likes the odds to be stacked against him. Earlier, he had called Gideon to fight the Midianites. Gideon says, uh, I'm nobody. I come from a really small clan, and I'm a really, and a really small family and a small clan, and I'm the least of them. Why are you calling me? God says, you're just the man for the job. So he puts together an army. He gathers 32,000 people, and Jesus, um, Jesus, God says to him, it's far too many. Got to get rid of some of them. So he said, anybody that's frightened and wants to go home for their tea, you can leave. So 10,000 went home, left them with 22,000. And God says, it's far too many. And as you know, he whittled it down to he had 300. From 32,000 to 300. That's the odds that God likes. So let's go and fight a nation. Um, a whole mixture of nations. Of course, he won. Because God says, I don't want you to fight a battle and think that you won because of your great numbers or because of your tactical abilities. 
I want you to realize that it's me. Time after time, God does that. When an 80-something-year-old Daniel entered into a den of hungry lions, the odds were stacked against him. And yet the next morning he walked out like he'd been on his holidays because that's what God does. And ultimately when Jesus hung on a cross, that seemed like the biggest catastrophe of all. And yet on the third day, he rose again from the dead. God loves it to look like we are weak so that he can be seen to be strong because it's not about us. It's always about him. That's the way God works. So anyway, he issues a challenge to the people. Verse 20 long, 21. How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. And the Baal is God, follow him. No point in having a kind of, oh, this is what we believe, but this is what we do, or whatever it is. How long will you waver between two opinions? And the people were silent. It's interesting that that word waver, it's, it's a word that means limp. It's like he's saying, how long will you limp between two opinions? In a spiritual sense, they are limping. They're not living the full spiritual life that they should be. They're not living in the light of their relationship with God. He wanted them to live this great adventure, but they were limping along. They were kind of committed to them, to, to, to Yahweh, but really their hearts belong to another. Limping between two opinions never works. Isn't that what Jesus said? He warned that you couldn't serve two masters. It just doesn't work. But rather, God is looking for a wholehearted commitment. It's not the first commandment. Don't have any other gods before me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength. God is looking for our commitment. He did not have it. So Elijah sets out the terms, the challenges of the challenge. Two bulls, get the bulls ready. Cut them up in pieces. Get your altar ready, ready for sacrifice. Put down the wood. Put the bulls on the wood. Um, but don't set fire to them. And then we're going to call out to our God. You call out to Baal. I will call out to Yahweh. And see if they're going to send down fire. And whoever sends down fire and lights, puts a light to the bull, that is the one true God. The people said, that sounds like a really good idea. Let's go for it. And that's what they did. Sounds like a plan. So the prophets of Baal, they prepare their bull. Get the wood, build the altar, put the bull on it. And they start calling out to their God, send fire, send fire. From early morning to lunchtime, they were worn out. They shouted to their God. Their God appeared not to hear them. It says in verse 26, they danced around the altar they had made. Now that's very interesting as well. They danced around the altar because the word that's translated danced is exactly the same word in verse 21 that is translated waver. It means to limp. Exactly the same word. They danced around the altar. In a sense, they thought they were dancing, but really, from God's point of view, they were limping. So, Elijah begins to taunt them. Shout louder. Maybe your God's on a journey. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's fallen asleep. You need to shout louder because they just don't hear you. And that's what they did, verse 28. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until the blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. All that effort for nothing. Verse 30. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which was in ruins. Isn't that interesting? He repaired the altar of the Lord. So there was a time when they worshipped God in this place, but that was a long time ago. Fallen into ruin. 
So Elijah rebuilds and he gets 12 stones, one stone for each tribe. He rebuilds the altar. He puts the wood on it. He puts the bull and pieces on it. He digs a trench around it. Then he gets some of the guys fill four big jars of, with water and come and they pour it all over the bull. They said, do it again. They do it again. Do it a third time. They do it a third time. Water is everywhere. It fills the trench. He's making it really hard for himself as though things were not more d- difficult enough. It's as though he's trying to make a point. Verse 36, then Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. And that's the whole point of the story. Let it be known that you are God. Then verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. This is what Elijah wants. He wants these people who have been led astray to know that their God is the real God, the one and only God, the one who will send fire because they had wandered so far away. Israel were the chosen people, but now they were languishing in spiritual depravity. Israel who were a nation meant to be a light to the other nations, limped around in darkness, embraced the darkness, the darkness of pagan idolatry. Jesus picked up those ideas in his Sermon on the Mount. Remember when he talked about the importance of being salt and light? That's what the nation of Israel meant to be, salt and light to the world, to show them a better way to live. But they had become like the world, worse than the rest of the world perhaps. And Jesus picks that up and said, you, that's you and me, we're called to be salt and light. Salt is a preservative. Salt was highly valued. Rub it into the meat to keep it good. But it needs to be in the meat. We need to be in the world to do good. But Jesus did say, whenever the salt loses its saltiness, what use is it? Just throw it outside. People will walk in it. It's useless. That's what Elijah was doing for the people here. You're meant to be salt and you're useless. Let's get our saltiness back again. Or you're meant to be light, Jesus said. So what's the point of a light if you hide it under a bowl, under a bed? If you hide your light, it's useless. But if you light your light, let your light shine, then everybody will benefit from it. And that's what we're called to be. People who shine, reflect the light of Jesus, who talk about him, who live lives confidently in our faith, so people can see a better way to live, the only way to live that leads to life. Decay is seen everywhere, and we're called to be salt in the midst of that. We're called to be light in the midst of that. When I was in Belfast last week, um, um, we're out walking and I saw this sign which is near the primary school of what I used to go to. And uh, do not obstruct this gate in constant use, 24-7. Um, so this is a, the back end of a house that used to be a um, children's home kind of a thing. And uh, it was a car park. Actually, this gate hasn't been opened donkey's years. It's not used anymore. You can't use the house. It's, 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 it's not livable in. So this gate has not been in, but the sign is still there. Do not obstruct this gate. It is unused, used 24-7. And Israel at this time were a bit like that. They had a sign that said, we are God's chosen people. We live in God's chosen land. But actually, we're not, we're not living like that anymore. We've still got a sign, but it means nothing. And it made me think about my own life where people know you're a Christian, or you go to church. You've still got a sign. There's a sign that says you are this or that, but am I really this or that? Because nobody really knows. Nobody knows the state of my prayer life or what I'm like at home. No, I'm really, really nice, actually. Um, 
But you know what I mean? We can have a sign, we can look good on the outside, but actually inside, we could be like those Pharisees that Jesus used to talk about. Outside you look great, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. We can so easily become that. It's a warning to all of us. A warning to all of us because we so easily slip into paganism, worshipping all sorts of things, forgetting about the God who has saved us, forgetting about the God who loves us, forgetting about the God who is the Lord of this building even, why it's here. We can so easily forget, be led astray. It's a warning to all of us. Israel had forgotten who God was, the God who they once knew really intimately, but is... um, Elijah wanted them to have that relationship again. He wanted to restore that relationship. They were married to God. They belonged to him. So let's get back to that. So he cries out to God. And he only has to do it once. He doesn't have to shout all day long. Once. And the fire of God fell to earth. And everything was burnt up. Including the stones. Can you imagine the heat to consume the stones? Everything was burnt up. And then the people knew this was God, and they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And for a moment, for a moment, for a brief moment in their history, the spiritual drought was over. It would return again very soon become catastrophic, they would be taken away into exile because we're so thick. But for that moment in history, the spiritual drought was over. God had made his point. And so the physical drought, the lack of rain, could cease also. It hadn't rained for three years. It's a long time, isn't it? But God's intention was to send rain. He tells us that back in verse 1. I'm going to send rain. But you know, he needed something to happen in order for his will to be done. I'm going to send rain. How will rain come? Elijah had to pray. And for today, that's our last scene. We see Elijah on his face praying. And he sends someone to look out to the Mediterranean. Do you see any clouds? No. Go again and have a look. Seven times he sent. He sent him, and the seventh time he came back and said, I see a cloud rising from the sea, the size of a man's hand. Then he goes to Ahab and says, you better get out of here. The rain is a coming. You better get home or you'll be stuck. And the rain did come, but Elijah had to pray. For you and I, that's what we're called to do as well. The book of James in the New Testament picks up the story of Elijah. He reminds us that Elijah, although an amazing prophet, was an ordinary person who served an extraordinary God. James reminds us that Elijah prayed, and we too can pray powerfully like Elijah For he reminds us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful. So Elijah's no different from you and you and you and you and you and you. And when we pray to this God who is amazing, who knows what can happen? Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain and it didn't. Then he prayed that it would, and it did. It's God who did it, but God uses the prayers of ordinary people to work out his extraordinary will in the lives of people. Who knows where our world is heading? Crazy world at the moment. But if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Then who knows what miracles can happen. Amen. Dawn's going to bring our prayers, our lead us in our prayers of intercession.
Let's join together to pray. Our Father, we do come to you as the God who can do amazing things, who can do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine. And we're reminded that the miracles that you can do, Lord, are to show your glory and to turn the hearts of people back towards you. For those of us who love you, the miracles you do are to encourage us in our walk with you, to remind us of who you are, to show us afresh the power of the living God. And the miracles that occur are to show the people around us just who you are, that you are a God who can do just things that they could not even think of. And so we come to you this morning, Father, to pray for uh, people we know in our church and in our families, to pray for our country, to pray for our world. Our Father, we pray for people um, who have had surgery or um, different kind of interventions in hospital in this past week. Father, we pray for their continued recovery. We pray for Debbie and for Brian and ask, Lord, that you will bring healing, uh, continued healing to each of them, that you will restore them uh, and that the surgery and the interventions that have happened will have been worthwhile and purposeful for each of them, Lord. Our Father, we want to pray for little Lara. Uh, thank you, Father, for the skill that you have given to those surgeons who can do such intricate surgery on such a tiny little child. And Lord, we pray. We just pray that you will bring healing and wholeness to that little girl's life. We ask for a miracle, Lord. And we pray, Father, for uh, strength for her family as they have watched her for these last months, Lord. Father, we pray for encouragement and we pray for hope. Pray that you will be very close to them, Lord, and that this will be a time of just really their faith being grown and strengthened and just a time, Lord, that will be so important to them as they look back in the years to come. And Father, we pray for those who will go into hospital for surgery this week ahead as well. And we pray for Valerie Warmel and ask that you will give the surgeons uh, skill as they uh, operate on her Lord and that, that you will heal her and that it will be so helpful to her for her mobility to be able to get around again. Our Father, we pray for our country. We pray as the as we move out of lockdown and yet things are still not uh, as they should be. Some of the counties are returned to a form of lockdown. Father, we just pray for wisdom for our leaders as they make really tough decisions and how hard that must be for them. Lord, we pray that you would guide them and we pray that we would be um, willing to set aside our own selfish uh, desires for the good of our society and for those around us. I pray, Father, for uh, schools as they plan to return. Pray for, um, for principals and for teachers as they plan for that and as they move towards um, some kind of way of educating our children together again and yet keeping them safe. Oh Lord, give them wisdom. Um, yeah, just keep them safe, Lord. Protect them. Do something miraculous in our world. And Father, we pray especially this morning for um, the country of Beirut or the city of Beirut. Um, in that country, Lord, that has endured so much over the years, so close to where we've even been thinking about this morning. Father, for a country that has been um, governed by those whom, who 
are corrupt and selfish, um, where people are struggling in so many ways, where the effects of COVID have already um, had their impact on their health service and now to be dealing with these hundreds and thousands of people who have been injured or killed. Our Father, we just really pray for, I don't know, just for comfort for those who mourn, for healing for those who are injured, for, for hope in the midst of what must feel hopeless, to look at that city that you lived in that is just wiped out. Oh, Father, we pray for us as Christians in the world that we would respond to our brothers and sisters who have so little. Lord, let us give. Let us follow you without counting the cost. And let, let what we do um, and pray and give and be, let that speak, Lord to a hurting and hopeless people. Help them, we pray, Lord. And Father, for ourselves, we just pray that you would um, call our hearts to real wholehearted commitment to you, to live lives that um, are prepared to lay down our own selfish ambitions and to be who you want us to be, to humble ourselves, Lord, and to pray to let nothing else be more important to us than following you, the living God. Help us, we pray. Amen. I'm going to finish by singing two songs. We're going to sing Abba Father. I haven't sung this one in a long, long time. Never let my heart grow cold. Never let me go. That's the kind of key line in that song. And I'm going to sing, uh, Breathe on me, breath of God. Fill me with life in you, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou wouldst do. So there are prayers. We'll remain seated for the first one, shall we? And then I'll let you stand the second one. And you can sing along if you like. <laughs> Father, let 
take that wonderful story away with you and the challenge that it comes with, the warning that it brings. It's been really good to be back with you again today. Look forward to seeing you next Sunday, hopefully. And if you're not here and you'd like to come, please do come. Sign up on the website. Um, that would be really good. As we leave today, there's the offering basket if you have an offering today. So she would say the words of the grace to each other. She would look at one another, even with her masks on, we can still smile. And... Uh, and bless each other with these words. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>